If you're watching this, then you know by now a huge problem is heading our way. An emergency meeting is being called at our usual place immediately. Free bagels. I started reading KC and I was already interested because I, I, I've, I, I initially liked his, his tenacity, his energy, his commitment to his intellectual pursuit. But then the more I read it, the answer became very clear that I can do everything with this. I, I, there are moments in this story where, as Casey, I can play absolutely everything. There are moments of, of sadness, there are moments of humour, there are, there are moments of pure joy and elation, there's a real anger and a fury to him sometimes, and, and there's a tenderness to him too in the friendship story between him and Brian and, and Fowler. And I, and I just thought there was, there was a moment in this story where all of those things and so many more things are gonna get touched upon. And it, it, just, feel, it just felt like a great, a great showcase for any actor and also uh, to, to play such an important role in a story that had so much scope to it and so much ambition to it, to be a, a pivotal, to play a pivotal role in the telling of that story and get to do everything I did whilst acting that part, it was just irresistible from the minute I started reading it. When we first meet Casey, he's a man who in so many ways is completely isolated. He feels like, he, he feels like an island, he feels like a person who's completely alone in the world and in so many different ways for a start he's he's physically isolated from his childhood because he grew up in England and now he's he's moved back with his mother to uh, to uh, America after the death of his father so he's transplanted in one way he's also feels a disconnect from his family because his father has died he's got no brothers and sisters and his mum has dementia so she doesn't recognize him anymore so there's no point of contact there he doesn't have he doesn't have any friends in particular he doesn't have a he doesn't have a relationship so he's emotionally isolated he's also intellectually isolated because he's he works with people who don't have any time for the things that he believes in he's always trying to communicate the things that he believes and his his passions and his interests and his theories to people and none of them are interested so yeah, at the start we find him completely alone in the world and, and, and searching for a point of contact, searching for a kindred spirit and searching for a, a, an ear that wants to listen to what he has to say. The great thing about working with Roland is that it's always inspiring to work with somebody who is an absolute master of what they do. In terms of the, the disaster movie, he, he's done other movies, he shouldn't just be defined by his work on disaster movies, but in terms of the, of the disaster movie genre, he's not only perfected a lot of those motifs, he created a lot of those motifs. And, that's, and, and it's, it's, so, it's such a, a game raiser to work with somebody who, whose instincts for these things are so exactly on point. And, you know, if, if you can't get Roland Emmerich to direct your disaster movie, get someone who can copy Roland Emmerich to direct your disaster movie. And so we know that in terms of the visuals, in terms of the suspense, all of the devices that he uses to create this disaster movie narrative, we know that any input that we have on that is redundant, really. But what he does do, he, he creates a very a very collaborative atmosphere when it comes to actors and their characters because he wants to make sure that all of these characters are as rich as possible. Brian and Fowler, they, they have a, a history and they've, they've been on missions together before and they, sh and they share this past and certain catastrophic events have happened to them in the past that they both shared and they both processed in different ways and it's interesting then for, for Casey to join that energy because you get you get these two characters who have this this shared backstory and there's a lot of context between them and and Brian is a character that 
carries an awful lot of regret around with him. He carries a lot of pain around with him. And, and Fowler knows all about that. And, and there's been conflict between them and there still is conflict between them now. And for Casey, he's an observer to that a lot of the time. He's slightly outside of that. And he, it's almost like, you almost get the impression sometimes that it's like the child observing two arguing parents. That sometimes you feel that he just wants them to get along. And, 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 and that's, that, that's down to the script, of course, but that's, that, that's a huge testament to Patrick and Halley's performances as well, that, that, you, that this connection between them is absolutely manifest. It's been amazing to work with Patrick and Halley. They're, they're two actors who have really elevated what was already the two very, very interesting characters on the page, and they've made them so much more. I think what, what Patrick brings to Brian is this, this feeling, especially early on in the film, although he does have a, a redemptive arc as well, you get a sense of the pain that he's carrying around. You get a sense that he's, he's, his demons are banging at the door 24-7. And although he turns into a hero, he's always a reluctant hero. And I think that that's something that, that is, is, is a very fine balance to play. Somebody that, that he's, he's, he's kind of forced to adopt the role of the hero when he doesn't feel qualified and he doesn't feel really capable of doing it. And I think that Patrick is an actor that's so committed to making every single second credible and believable and psychologically valid. Hallie as Fowler, <clears throat> she manages to do something that's also very tricky. And it, it, it takes a, 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 a very unique screen presence to do it, where she marries two sides of this character that feel almost completely contradictory. Like they, these two sides of a character shouldn't exist as successfully together because on one hand she's she's very commanding she takes no bullshit she's a she's a badass and she's a she's a, a commander and she's in charge and she's and she's very powerful and on the other hand she has this softness and this kindness and a gentleness to her when you see her with a family where you see her sharing these tender moments with Brian and sometimes Halley is able to play those two sides of this character simultaneously, not go backwards and forwards between the two. You always believe that she's commanding and you always believe that she's tender. And it takes, a, it takes somebody with an with a incredible aptitude for the craft to be able to pull that off, I think. The scenes in the shuttle, they've been a, they've been a challenge to film, really, because, because you have to rely so heavily on your own imagination. To, to pull those kind of scenes off. You're, you're being guided through the scene by an off-camera voice that tells you what you have to be reacting to on a, on a kind of second-by-second -second basis. But because we haven't seen the visuals, really, we've seen a very loose uh, previous, so we, we sort of know the shape of it, but we don't really know what we're reacting to visually. That's, it can be sometimes quite difficult to engage with. And also, because we're in this shuttle and we're all strapped into our seats and usually there's two and one. So in the, in the endeavor, it was me behind and then Hallie and Patrick in front of me. And then in the, in the lander, it's me and Hallie here and Patrick in front. You don't really feel that you're acting with people because you feel that you can't, I can't see Patrick's face. I can't really see Hallie either. You, you feel like you're acting in a bubble and it's just all about the images that your imagination can conjure up and how you can find a way of reacting to something that isn't there. One of the things that's impressed me about, about the, the design elements and the sets in particular are the way that through, through the narrative journey of the story, the landscape completely changes. And I think that what's great about Roland's movies in general is that when it's early on in the movie and it's set in the real world, 
it really feels like the real world. He doesn't feel like a, a, a glamorous sci-fi disaster movie with a lot of very, very stylized sets and a lot of spectacular design elements. Early on, it feels grounded in a real unglamorous, mundane reality that you can feel completely immersed in. And it's important that you do feel completely immersed in that because the, the elements of the movie early on that are set in, you know, on planet Earth 2020, they have to be real because you have to create a real world which is in jeopardy and which is in danger of being destroyed later on in the film. So all of those early sets, Casey's apartment, the, re the retirement home, the burger place that he works in, they felt so real and so immersive that you're instantly transported into that world and you start to care about that world. It feels like a world that deserves to be defended. Then as you go through the film, the sets and the design becomes more and more stylized. And then you end up in the interior of the moon. You know what I mean? But somehow that feels like one whole journey. So I think the thing that's impressed me most is it feels authentic at every single moment. It's on airplane mode. Look like we're in for nasty weather. 